Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so pleased to have you join us. This is Leslie Muldoon. I'm the Executive Director here uh, of the Governing Board. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Stefan Harris, who will get us started. Great. Um, thank you, Leslie. Um, uh, I want to welcome everyone here to the uh, webinar we're having um, on our nominations campaign. Um, I'm uh, Stefan Harris. I oversee outreach and communication for the board. Um, we're very excited to share uh, in, uh, information with you about our campaign, about our positions, board members' response, uh, responsibilities, uh, requirements, and most importantly, you're going to hear from the mem uh, members themselves on their roles, uh, what, they, uh, what they do in, uh, uh, as they serve on the board. So I think they'll be uh, 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 bring some great insight to it. Um, I do want to let everyone to know we encourage you to ask uh, questions on anything you hear uh, today. Um, and just so people uh, know, it's uh, to ask uh, to have a query, ask a question. You click the Q and A box on the black min, uh, menu bar, then type it in the box. We will answer those questions. Uh, questions after we presented um, background on the board and the nomination process and once the members uh, shared their experiences and roles on um, on the board. Uh, again, uh, to ask a question, click the Q&A box and you will type uh, uh, your question uh, your question in that box. We will be able to be able to uh, see it and be able to respond to you uh, after everybody has made their presentation. So uh, with that, thanks everybody for being on, and I'm going to first to turn it over to our Executive Director, Leslie Muldoon. Thank you so much, Stefan, and thanks again for joining us this afternoon. I will start by sharing a little bit of information on the Governing Board, as well as on NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. I will go over the nominations process for you, and then I will introduce uh, three of our amazing board members who are joining us this afternoon, Andrew Ho, Tanya Matthews, and Mark Miller. Uh, they will each share a little bit of their perspectives with you about their board service and answer, answer your questions once we get to the end of the call. So let's get started. And first, we'll talk, talk briefly about NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also known as the Nation's Report Card. Uh, it serves as the only objective, nationally representative benchmark on student achievement and progress in the United States. So it plays a really critical role in helping education stakeholders across the country understand how well children are learning the important content that schools are teaching. Uh, we assess students in grades 4, 8, and 12 in a variety of subjects. And most results for the assessments are reported at the national level. There are some assessments that, uh, where we can report results as disaggregated by state and for the nation's largest urban school districts. It's important to note that there are no school or student level results from the NAEP assessments uh, and that they are not used for accountability purposes. It's really intended to serve as an objective external reference on the progress of American education. And we partner really closely with our colleagues at the National Center for Education Statistics, NCES. Uh, they're responsible for the operational and administrative functions of NAEP. Uh, including going out in the field and actually collecting data uh, with students. So now let me talk for a moment about what the Governing Board does. The Board is an independent, nonpartisan organization that was created by the U.S. Congress in 1989 to set policy for NAEP and to oversee the NAEP program. The Board's core responsibilities include determining what subjects NAEP will assess and the content and design of those assessments, the board sets the achievement levels for each of the assessments, which supports the reporting out of student results. And the board oversees the release of report cards, or the results of each of the assessments. So you may be familiar with every two years, uh, there's a big announcement about the reading and mathematics results for fourth and eighth grade students. The board is responsible for overseeing that and for the initial release of those results. And finally, uh, board staff and board members are responsible for forging partnerships across the country 
to help encourage and facilitate the use of NAEP data by education stakeholders, all with the goal of helping, helping local educators and policymakers improve educational outcomes for students. Now let me share a little bit about, uh, about serving on the governing board. The board is um, comprised of 26 members that reflect the diversity of the nation's <laughs> education stakeholders. It includes governors, chief state school officers, state legislators, members of state and local boards of education, superintendents and principals, classroom teachers, curriculum specialists, testing and measurement experts, business representatives, general public representatives, and a representative from uh, the non-public school community because NAEP uh, includes non-public schools, religious schools, independent schools, private schools in, in the sample. Service on the board is uh, a secretarial appointment, so it's an appointment by the U.S. Secretary of Education. The board uh, manages a process to solicit nominations, which is the process we're talking about today, and uh, reviews all applications and proposes uh, finalists to the secretary for appointment. Terms on the board are for four years, starting October 1st of, of any given year, uh, and board members are eligible to be reappointed to a second four-year term. I think the board members can attest to this when we get to their remarks at the end of this uh, later in the call, but this is a working board. It is not an honorific position. Uh, the board really uh, rolls up its sleeves and digs in to set policy for me. They do this through quarterly meetings primarily. Uh, half of the year, for two meetings a year, we, we typically meet in Washington, D.C. And the other two meetings, we, we try to go out into other parts of the country, into cities and states where our board members reside so that we can learn more about the local education context in different parts of the country. Occasionally, board members will uh, join calls or webinars between board meetings to get updated on priorities or provide input into um, you know, timely, timely matters. Every board member serves on a committee. There are uh, four committees, the Assessment Development Committee, which um, oversees the design and content of the assessments, the Committee on Standards, Design, and Methodology, which uh, Andrew chairs, and he'll talk about that in a few moments, um, and that committee is responsible for a lot of the technical aspects of our, our oversight of NAEP. And then the Research and Dissemination Committee is responsible for overseeing a lot of the research agenda and the reporting of results from NAEP. The fourth committee is the Nominations Committee, uh, which includes board members who help review uh, applications and help us with the process of um, creating a slate of, of nominees for appointment to the board. Each committee has a chair and a vice chair, and along with the board chair and board vice chair, those committee chairs and vice chairs comprise the board's executive committee. I will say uh, that the culture of the board is pretty unique and um, inspiring to me as executive director. The board members are incredibly hardworking, committed, and passionate about doing what's best for students and teachers and families, um, and ensuring that NAEP can support educational achievement and equity in this country. So uh, it's an incredibly collegial and collaborative group that are uh, really um, further the mission and goals of the program in a, a truly inspiring way. Let me now um, talk a little bit about what positions are open in this year's uh, call for nominations. We have a significant number of positions that are open for appointment. As you can see, this is about one-third of the seats on the board. Uh, we are striving to recruit the most diverse pool of applicants ever so that the board can, can truly reflect the nation's K-12 student population. So we have um, Right, we have an amazing array of people on the phone today and are really excited about, about that, uh, that outreach. We are looking for a chief state school officer, two general public representatives with the goal of one of those uh, being a leader, a parent leader. We're looking for a local school board member, a non-public school administrator or policymaker, a state legislator, both a Democrat and a Republican, a testing and measurement expert, and a 12th grade teacher. And these are for terms that begin on October 1st of 2020. As you could uh, transition, I want to talk about how you can join the governing board. 
So uh, hopefully, well, since you're on this webinar, you probably have seen our website. Uh, you can go to nagv.gov to view the application for uh, service on the board, as well as some FAQs and a document that provides guidance on how to nominate yourself or others to serve on the National Assessment Governing Board. It's important to note you can nominate yourself or you can have someone else nominate you. Someone else can nominate you. Um, you, if you are applying, you need to submit a personal statement, a CV or a resume, and at least one letter of support from a colleague uh, who knows you well. You can submit up to two additional letters, but we cap it at three letters of support. And most important of all is to note that nominations are due on October 18th. So you have just under a month to get everything submitted, and we, we hope that you will we'll do so. So before we get to questions, I now want to introduce um, our board members who are going to speak for a few minutes each about their, their service on the board thus far um, and, and share any advice or reflections with you about the nominations process. Uh, uh, first up, we have Andrew Ho, one of our testing and measurement experts on the board. He has served on the board since 2012, so he has, has a lengthy tenure and has been just an incredible, um, incredible leader for us. He chairs the board's Committee on Standards, Design, and Methodology. So, Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Leslie. Mark, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Good. Uh, great. Um, hi, everybody, uh, and uh, hello from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm, I'm a professor at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Um, uh, but this uh, National Assessment Governing Board, um, uh, my, my service on, on this board, um, I can say this honestly, the single greatest service commitment that I've ever experienced, and I'm going to miss it dearly when I rotate it off the board uh, in a year's time. Uh, so I want to just give you um, three reasons why I've enjoyed my uh, seven years um, on the board, uh, and hopefully that will um, uh, motivate you to nominate yourself and others um, for this for this position. Um, so the, the first reason is uh, that that this this uh, assessment that we have, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, truly is, uh, has a 50-year history. It's got an incredible reputation. It is known by educators, policymakers, and researchers like me alike as the gold standard for assessment. And just being a part of that, um, the upholding the gold standard, the history and the reputation of, of NAEP uh, is, is really is really important. It, 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 I was a graduate student in, in, in you know, 20 years ago now, just starting to do research and I was so, so grateful that these data existed because who else is answering the question of how we're making progress in reading and mathematics and other subjects uh, at a national and state level in a comparative way uh, over, over decades, right? And no one else is doing that and everyone is so, so grateful that we have a measure like this. So the first simple reason is just to, you know, again, up uphold the history and reputation of, of this of this sort of gold standard. Um, uh, the second reason um, are, are the board members, and, and Leslie mentioned this. Uh, it's just such a diverse group of people who are also deeply invested in education and the importance of good um, assessment that provides useful information. And just the conversations that we have over dinner, uh, not to mention the substantive conversations that we have around the board table, are, are really unique. And uh, you know, again, from from the teachers and and the superintendents and the principals and the chief state school officers and the state board members and the governors and the parents, right? Everyone is coming at it from their own uh, unique perspective and advocating for the people uh, they, they represent. And at the same time, we're all sort of in it for the right reasons. Uh, and that's just been remarkable too. And I should add in addition to the board members, the staff that you see sitting uh, there in front of you or did just before the picture blacked out uh, are absolutely stellar too. And uh, although we may provide um, some of the vision and, and some of the work, it's just remarkable how much the staff helps us enact that vision. Um, and, and it's just been a pleasure to work with my fellow board members and the staff over the past seven years. Uh, and the final reason, you know, is, is, is the substantive issues that, that we talk about. And, you know, we're thinking about the future of national assessment uh, in this country and what is important um, that kids, uh, that we understand that kids are know and are able to do and how we're making progress on it, right? It's the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And we all hope that that progress happens, um, but there is no product, there's no assessment like NAEP that's answering that um, with, in, with such rigor and in such uh, a comparable way across states and districts uh, in, in this country. And so just to have these conversations, you know, over these uh, two-day meetings uh, uh, um, quarterly, right? Um, to talk about like should we how do we 
balanced trade-offs between the breadth of what we measure and the depth of what we measure, right? How do we think about what reading is and what mathematics is and what is important for these for, for kids in fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade to know? Like these are really interesting conversations. And again, with such a diverse group of people around the table who are all deeply committed to it, they're just conversations like no other, and I've treasured them. And so uh, I hope uh, you ask um, questions. Um, and my one tip for you for nominations is to look at our strategic vision, right? We have the strategic vision document uh, up on the up on um, our website. We're talking about uh, a visioning plan over the next year. But this is again, what does what should NAEP be in 2025? What should NAEP be in 2030, right? These are interesting uh, questions about, about how we can serve uh, this country and our kids uh, as best as possible with, with a national assessment. So I, I think you should take a look in that and, at that and you'll see how thoughtful we've been and I hope you'll join the conversation um, around the board table and, and nominate yourself and others to do so. Uh, so I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Andrew. Now I'd like to introduce Tanya Matthews. Tanya serves as the Vice Chair of the Board, and she is one of our General Public Representatives. She's been a member since 2014 and serves on the Reporting and Dissemination Committee. Tanya, I'll turn it to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to explore uh, this opportunity. Uh, as uh, Leslie stated, I am uh, currently the Vice Chair of the National Assessment Governing Board. Uh, I am Associate Provost for Inclusive Workforce Development and Director of STEM Innovation Learning at Wayne State University. Uh, so clearly I have all of the buzzwords uh, in my title. Uh, so as we think about uh, workforce development and this, this um, conversation we continue to have on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math learning, um, the work that we do um, at NAGME, the, the governing board, is really relevant to all of those conversations. I sit on the reporting and dissemination committee, um, and our task is to take all of this information and the different kinds of things that we're learning and figure out how to communicate that outward uh, to various um, audiences. Uh, what kind of conversation um, are we intending to spark inside the education community? Uh, that's where we have representatives um, like chief school officer and uh, school board officials as well as um, teachers. Um, that is one conversation. Um, what do parents and students need to know? The advantage of this conversation is that we report out on the nation's progress and we give indications of what our students know, what our communities are capable of. But if you don't get a particular answer about what you are doing in school that week, how do you translate that? How do you use that? How do you motivate the kind of conversations that you want to have um, with your school? at your uh, PTA meetings and sort of those kinds of things. Um, and of course, you know, just a, a moment with Andrew uh, shows you that we have brilliant people that sit on our board uh, and figuring out how to translate that into meaningful chunks uh, that we can talk about, um, as well as breaking it down into meaningful chunks. You know, sometimes we do want to look at how are our young ladies doing uh, versus our young gentlemen in particular subjects? How are our large urban districts doing in comparison with the rest of the nation? Um, we'd like to know, does having a computer at home make a difference? Does whether or not you are doing your math homework uh, on pen and paper exclusively or if you are actually getting tutoring online, does that make a difference? So this committee also has input into those kinds of questions. What else do we need to know about how students are getting uh, their experiences in terms of being able uh, to respond to this kind of assessment and the questions uh, that we're asking. One of the things I'm most excited about um, is we are right now exploring how to generate a post-secondary preparedness dashboard. One, the word dashboard gets me excited because it sounds like something I can navigate uh, quickly and easily. But the second thing is, when we think about what a successful child looks like, when they finish, say, high school, that answer is very different for many students, many communities, many industries, many pathways forward. Is there one way for us to pull together all the information we have and say, this is um, our potential for success? 
uh, with everything that we put in. That can be college. That could be career. That can be college and career. That can be gap year. That can be, frankly, saving the world. And so we are looking at a way to communicate that in a meaningful way, which is going to pull together the academic data. It's going to pull together the contextual data about the experiences they've had, the motivation data. So we are really excited about that. Um, many of you may be familiar with uh, some of the work we do in our NAEP release events. So now we actually release in very experiential ways. Um, the first time we did a release for the technology and engineering literacy uh, NAEP assessment, we actually did it at a science center, full disclosure. It was my science center at the time. Uh, so I was uh, the CEO at the Michigan Science Center in Detroit. And one of the advantages of that is that we also were able to include student voice in the release of these results. And so we're always looking for bringing compelling audiences to the table and releasing this information in an exciting way that encourages us to ask more conversations and uh, more questions. Um, and so I would close, um, as Andrew did, sort of, I think, with my tip around thinking through the applications. Uh, I will say, you know, sometimes you see uh, those notices of you can be nominated by a colleague or you can nominate yourself and you wonder, does it really make a difference? Like if I nominate myself, does that look bad? Does it look like no one believes that I should be taking this opportunity except for me? And I would say that I have sat on the nomination committee um, and self-nominations are just as powerful. I myself am a self-nominated, uh, now happily uh, sitting board member. And for me, one of the most compelling things um, is the letter that we write ourselves. I think particularly uh, for me, I am a general representative uh, and so many of us come from many different categories for many different reasons. And I always find that the personal letter um, that are written to go along with the applications really helps me put the entire packet um, that you've put together to introduce yourself to us in context. Uh, and so that would be sort of my tip uh, and trick for um, completing your application and putting it through. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, now I'd like to introduce Mark Miller. Mark is a board certified teacher who teaches eighth grade in Colorado Springs and he serves as the eighth grade teacher representative on the governing board. He is one of our newest board members uh, since he has his first year of service and he has been just a wonderful member of the board and a member of the assessment development committee. So Mark, uh, I'll turn it over to you to talk more about your first year experience. Great. Thank you, Leslie. I'm really excited to talk to you all today um, about becoming a member of NAGBI. It, it really wasn't that long ago that I was in the same position that many of you are, uh, thinking about uh, being a part of something uh, bigger than you currently are a part of, um, and wondering how a voice from a teacher or from a state legislator uh, could have an impact on education across the country. And uh, it was after a little bit of research, uh, I'll be honest, uh, Nate was not uh, at the uh, table conversation that we've been having uh, in the classroom. And so a little research, and I was very impressed with the work of NAGB. Uh, NAEP is a, an efficient testing system. Uh, they get in and out of schools quickly and get the data that they need. Um, they are able to have a low impact on uh, the practitioners, the teachers, and the students, and the uh, principals in the building. And so they have uh, created a, a way to get the information they need without the large stakes um, investment and the time required for teachers and students. Um, also, the structure of the test um, is really at the front of innovation and design, and so I was really excited to be a part of that. Um, the great part is, is working with state legislators, governors, uh, Harvard professors, uh, CEOs. Uh, as an eighth grade teacher, uh, it would have been intimidating, uh, but they, they value the voice of a teacher. Uh, the voice of a teacher is encouraged, and uh, we bring our different perspectives. And uh, so my experiences in the classroom working side by side with my students um, has been an important voice, and I feel valued by being a part of this board. Uh, I currently serve on the Assessment Development Committee. Uh, it is known as the hardest working board, and uh, whatever Andrew and Tanya tell you. Uh, we review and approve every NAEP question that you see on a NAEP assessment. 
Uh, we look at them multiple times. Uh, we want to make sure that we take our job very seriously, that we can put items on the test that represent uh, what our students should know and be able to do. Uh, we also look at all the con contextual questions as well. And so we have been heavily involved in making sure that we get the information that we need to be able to make uh, informed decisions and uh, be able to allow stakeholders to be informed by uh, the results that they see from those tests. Um, right now, we're currently working on the NAEP math framework. I am an eighth grade math teacher, and I am very excited about where we are going with the, with the math framework. It really is the blueprint for our upcoming assessments and uh, where we are going with math education uh, in, the, in the future. And so I get to be a part of that really meaty work and make contributions to education uh, from the other side, uh, from the uh, teacher leadership side. Uh, I've also been able to be a resource to my peers. Uh, as a NAGBE member, uh, I've had some help from the staff at NAGBE to uh, create a presentation that I've used at uh, uh, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. And uh, this summer, I guided participants through uh, NAEP test questions, contextual data, and how they can use the NAEP data uh, to uh, create lessons and uh, work for students uh, so that they can see in their classroom how their students are doing uh, and compared to students across the country. Uh, also, uh, like many of the other board members, uh, we have a great staff that uh, gets us involved in social media. So I've been able to be a part of some videos, uh, be a part of some promotional items that we use uh, for the tell release. And uh, so able to get uh, the word out in a uh, kind of a unique way through social media. Um, as the other members have mentioned, um, the most rewarding part of my job in the last year has been uh, being a part of such a diverse group, um, a hardworking group. Uh, it really is a team and uh, a team that's driven by a, a common goal and a common purpose. And uh, we have a wonderful staff that supports us. And uh, I would encourage all of you uh, to nominate yourself or to, if you've already been nominated, to dive into that application process. Uh, having gone through national board certification and other certifications, uh, the process to become a part of NAGBE is, uh, is one that, that uh, is providing me with a, a year's worth of uh, excellent service opportunities and an opportunity to uh, visit other parts of the country uh, to see students and teachers working in different locations. Uh, it is an opportunity that I am very blessed to be a part of and uh, this opportunity I think would be uh, valuable to whatever field and whatever position that you were looking to be a part of. Uh, it is a way to see education uh, through the eyes of uh, the National Assessment Governing Board. And uh, uh, that's about it for me for now. I'm happy to answer some questions and, and I look forward to uh, meeting some of you in a little over a year. Thank you so much, Mark, and, and Tanya and Andrew. I, I think for those of you um, listening in, this was a, a really wonderful look at the, the commitment and passion of members of our board and their, their incredible expertise about Nate. So now we'll move into the question and answer portion of our call. To ask a question about serving on the board and the nominations process, just a reminder to please click the Q&A box on the black menu bar on your screen and type your question into the box. Stefan is going to read us the questions and then pitch them to board members or to members of the staff to make sure we get everything answered. Great, thank you. Um, our first question is, could you give more information or website uh, info about uh, positions open for nominations? How do we nominate a local school board member? Tan, uh, Tan, uh, Tan yeah, did you want to take that one? So um, I would say that uh, as you're thinking about nominating other people, uh, rule number one, warn them. <laughs> that you are nominating. Um, and I think that is a great strategy. Um, with nominating other 
people, you actually will need to do that in partnership with them um, because in addition to the support letter from you that's going to be critical, um, they will also have to provide um, their own uh, brief bio and resume as well as their own letter of intent and intention. Um, so I think that um, that is a very good idea uh, in terms of nominating them. Um, but as you do nominate them, remember that there are additional steps that will have to be taken to uh, complete that application. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Tanya. One small addition, just you can go to www.nagb.gov. Uh, right on the, the home page of our website, the first thing you'll see is a link to the nominations page that will include the list of positions that are open for nominations in this cycle. And the, um, the, the link to the website through which you can nominate yourself or nominate another individual, that's also the website that folks use to upload their application resume and, or their, excuse me, their personal statement, their resume, and their letters of support. If you have questions, we'll share an email at the end. If you have some trouble navigating the site, you can reach out to us directly. More. Okay, um, our next one is approximately how many hours a month of time should a person expect uh, to serve in this role? Uh, Andrew, um, did you perhaps want to take that one? Considering how long you've been on the board, you can kind of really uh, give a good uh, uh, a view on that, I think. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take a crack at this. So uh, we have quarterly meetings, uh, and I usually fly down um, uh, sort of midday from Boston to DC um, on Thursday, um, and the meetings go uh, through Saturday midday. So, um, so those are those are essentially two uh, full days, you know, a half day and then a full day and then a half day um, of, of of meetings uh, quarterly. Um, usually in DC, but then one of the meetings um, that I think Tanya was alluding to is that one of the meetings a year we get to or Maybe Mark was alluding to it. Um, one, one meeting out of the year, uh, we go to a board member's um, uh, hometown or our place of residence and, uh, and get to know, get, we do a sort of school trip there. And so I usually try to fly out a day earlier if I can uh, to attend those meetings. Um, in addition to that, we do um, uh, have uh, calls that pop up between meetings when we have to um, uh, conduct business and, and sometimes advance motions. Um, and I should add that um, I'm speaking as a member and chair of the Committee on Standards Design and Methodology, and affectionately known as COSDAM. Uh, but uh, I think Mark is right. I defer to him. We are a pretty hardworking committee, but the Assessment Development Committee, uh, he, what he said is true. They, uh, they look at every single item. And so that committee usually flies in uh, for Thursday mornings uh, quite often. We sometimes have ad hoc committees as well, and so that can add uh, to the commitment. But um, one thing you can be sure of is that the, the work isn't uh, wasteful, right? And every single thing we're doing um, is, is truly important and moves the assessment forward. Um, we always have to, one of the longstanding debates uh, on the board is how much do we sort of, as, as a former chair put it, stick to our meeting versus push the envelope. And what's great about the board is that we have um, people who are always pushing and people who are always sort of sticking, and that's a constant conversation um, uh, in an effort, again, to measure um, relevance and progress. Uh, so I think Mark and Mark, I would probably say plus 50% for the Assessment Development Committee, but it's not wasted work. Um, uh, an assessment as, as a measurement person, what we always say is we start with content. We start with content. And so there's a reason why that committee in particular um, has a lot of work that's very, very important. And I would add to that and say um, we are particularly well staffed. Uh, that uh, part of that team that has served as our moderator um, because um, our meetings are working meetings. So when we talk about being a working board, um, the meetings are structures that we are actually getting a lot of work done at the meeting as we, as we constantly are trying to sort of take home the message we do actual work. I do also want to note that this is a board of active professionals. Um, so we do all um, have uh, other obligations. Uh, the closest we come to retirees are retired former governors, and one knows governors never actually retire. Uh, they're always being pulled in many, many different directions. And so I would say that even during the in-between meeting times and the work, uh, so um, the R&D uh, committee you know, we review the websites and sort of all those kinds of things during the, the interim. I've always found it to be very well staffed, very well orchestrated so that I know exactly what I have to do and when I have to get it done. So it is, 
It is work, but um, it's very well managed, um, and we get the opportunity to see its impact. So uh, that really does uh, make it worth it when I'm trying to balance the time. All right, great. Thank you both. Uh, our next question is uh, how, famil how familiar with NAEP or assessment, or assessment, assessment policy do I need to uh, have in order to join the board. Mark, since you're the newest one, why don't you take that one? I think you have a good uh, view on that. Absolutely. Uh, so my first conversation about NAEP was in my building uh, a couple years before uh, the National Governing Board uh, nomination came in. And uh, so we knew what it was. We don't get any individual student results or any uh, school results, but the conversation is what are these people doing in our building and why are they disrupting and they weren't disrupting They were in and out quickly. And so I knew of the test uh, I was not familiar as familiar with the National Assessment Governing Board um, but with a little bit of research and a little bit of time and uh, some extra time spent on my own to research it, which I would re definitely recommend doing um, if you are going to follow through with the nomination. Uh, get to know the National Assessment Governing Board. The website that's been created um, by our staff is great. It has lots of questions that, that you can, um, that you may have that will answer those questions. And uh, so being familiar with NAEP is helpful. Um, in one year's time, uh, I feel like I've gone from a very surface level, NAEP is a test that students take and we get a nation's report card, uh, to knowing the ins and outs of most every question um, that is asked and how all of the, uh, the trend of NAEP is valued. Uh, I think Andrew mentioned it, it's, it's over 50 years and uh, it's a very valuable part of what it is. It's the national assessment of educational and I will emphasize progress, and it's important that we keep that and we get a view of what uh, the test is doing from um, decades ago to, to where we're going in the future. And uh, so if you, if you come with a lot of information about NAEP, it's helpful. If you come with little information, uh, staff and the other board members will be able to get you caught up and get you caught up to speed very quickly. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, okay, we, we did get a question just for folks to know uh, what are board mem uh, members responsible for as far as travel for meetings um, and such? So, uh, uh, yeah, and Leslie, I'll, did I'll you want to The answer for that um, is that travel and accommodation costs for meetings are all covered by the governing board. Um, and as well as a per diem that is provided for meals that are not provided at the meeting. So you are reimbursed for or paid, the costs are paid directly for your travel, uh, et cetera, related to board service. Great, great. Okay, our next question is, I'm an assessment developer. Um, uh, hold on for a second. I'm an assessment developer for the last uh, 30 plus years. I've mostly been in the trenches of developing assessment, assessments and related activities. I have done work with NAEP. I'm not a psych, uh, psychometrician or a professor or bigwig in testing. Would some, would some, some uh, one like me be uh, considered for the board? Andrew, did you want to take that? This is kind of a little bit your area, so this may be a yes, good I, one to I, throw to you. I already did, and I, I hope I, I hope I was off. Uh, I hope I was muted while I was typing, I just realized. Um, but, but yeah, I, I actually just sent an answer to that um, online because okay. it was fairly specific. I'm not sure everyone would be interested in okay. it. But in short, um, yeah, uh, I, I would apply ambitiously. I gave you a little bit of a sense of the history of the category here, but I would nonetheless apply ambitiously. And also, uh, I think another person asked and had an answer about which category would be most appropriate. And so um, if, if, uh, if you think um, you're, you may be less of a fall into the category of testing and measurement expert, but another category is still quite applicable, you might consider that too. And I think Lisa uh, Stukesbury, our deputy director, um, is listed in the answered questions as someone you could talk to about that. Uh, but in general, um, I, uh, I am cautious whenever anyone says they have imposter syndrome. It's, it's, it's something that they, if, if you're here, you should apply ambitiously. Um, and. Uh, 
I don't. I think we should be inclusive, and especially at the nomination stage. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably underestimating your qualifications. And I would add to that, as folks are looking at the categories, folks may be thinking, so uh, what exactly is a general representative? What, what, what is that about and why are there two? Um, and so that is, um, it should not be mistaken as a, a catch-all category, but it is one of our categories that represents our um, dedication to inclusion, right? So one of the general um, public representatives uh, the one that is denoted as parent representative means uh, someone who is in the trenches around advocacy um, and has been um, an active uh, parent, uh, parent champion. So in the past, we've had that represented by folks who are very active in the PTA, um, being uh, locally, regionally, or nationally, um, someone who has sort of taken the charge uh, and actively in conversation from the perspective as a parent, but also networking with other parents. Right, in terms of being able to represent that um, voice of that community as well as being able to represent your own voice, an individual voice. Um, our other general representative category is broader, um, acknowledging that there are critical stakeholders in this conversation about national assessment of our students' educational progress uh, that have not been previously named. So I myself came in um, through my passion for uh, informal education, which is education outside of the classroom, often represented by museums and science centers, uh, and bringing uh, that to the conversation, but in still a rigorous and thoughtful way um, in terms of being able to bring that to the conversation. So the general representative categories are for those of us who are actively and meaningfully engaged in this conversation about education and assessment and, and progress, um, but perhaps may not be as easily defined uh, by some of the other categories that we've listed. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question, and I'm going to throw this to Mark because you are the most, you are the newest member, so I think you would, this would be fresh in your mind. The question is, board orientation takes place in what manner? <laughs> Mark, if you maybe want to describe what your experience was like uh, coming here for that to kind of orient yourself to the board and what we do and how it was like for you. Uh, first of all, I just say that board orientation is a very valuable part of the onboarding process onto the governing board. And uh, it was a 24 hour drinking through a fire hose, whirlwind, uh, just take it all in, good luck with that. And no, the staff did a great job of going through and explaining uh, our role as a board member. Uh, what to expect at board meetings. Uh, similar to this situation, we had a couple uh, board members uh, there to answer our questions. Staff members uh, were able to present uh, kind of the different components of uh, our job from budget, from NAEP uh, as a test, the structure of the test. We got the ins and outs, the nuts and bolts, and we left with a binder that required extra luggage to fly home. And that binder then uh, was perfect. Um, it was well set up for us to be able to go through and prepare. Uh, we did the orientation about a month before the first board meeting. So I had a month to dive into uh, the binder to go through uh, previous um, webinars like this. They have videos. Uh, it is a, um, it is a great deal of information, um, but it is all relevant and beneficial information. I felt like when I got to the first board meeting that I was ready to go. Uh, and uh, it's all, I mean, mainly in part due to the staff and how good the, the job the staff does of putting that together for the new members. All right, great. Thanks, Mark. That was, that was great. We appreciate that. Um, another question, um, how long will the nominations process take? When will I find out if I've been chosen to join the board? Leslie, did you want to uh, take that one? Sure. Thanks, Stefan. So the nominations, uh, we collect the nominations uh, annually during the fall. Typically, um, the, the window closes in uh, mid-October. This year, it's October 18th. Following that, board members spend several months going through the applications. 
and um, determining uh, who is qualified to serve in the positions in which they've been nominated. Um, and then the, the board will approve a slate of finalists, typically in the early, uh, early spring. And those finalists are then presented to the U.S. Secretary of Education for final appointments. Um, those final, finalists are notified that they have become finalists and are asked to submit an additional letter, typically. There's, there's one additional step in the process at that point. Um, and then those who are um, among the finalists are need to go through a background check with the U.S. Department of Education um, to ensure there are no conflicts of interest. So it takes quite a while. Um, by the uh, late summer of 2020, board members who are appointed for service starting in October of 2020 should be notified, uh, should, should have a clear indication that they will be, be starting board service. Anything, Lisa Stukesbury, our deputy director, who's more experienced with the nominations process than I am, anything you would add? Nothing that I would add. Uh, these questions have really been uh, insightful for us and help us think about uh, questions that, that um, folks we don't usually get to talk to, folks who are considering uh, uh, joining the board or applying to the board but have some um, pending questions that might make the difference in doing so. Um, I think the, the one thing I will add to what Leslie said is it really is about a year-long process. You're here with us today. Uh, nominations are due October 18th, and it's sometime later next year uh, before uh, the final um, appointments are made. But we as staff are available to you throughout the process um, to answer questions, to keep you updated. Uh, so we want to um, encourage you that uh, upon your nomination, uh, we consider you one of our own and we'll be ready and willing and able to talk to you anytime. Thank you, Lisa. I think uh, that all the questions that have been submitted thus far have been answered. So if there are, I'll wait a minute to see if anyone has additional questions. If so, please type them into the chat box, uh, or the Q&A box, excuse me. Um, and while I wait to see if anyone has additional questions, I will note if you think of something after this, this call, and uh, please feel free to reach out to us. You'll see um, an email address on your screen right now. It is uh, nagbnominations at ed.gov, and uh, you can submit your questions up there. It will go directly to our staff, and, and we will reach out to you to make sure we, we answer it. All right, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A, but um, if you think of one, please feel free to type it in. So I'll, I'll just thank Tanya and Andrew and Mark for sharing your experiences about the board with everyone, um, and remind our participants to please check out the website, nagv.gov, to uh, learn more about submission requirements and the nominations process. There's an FAQ document there. And um, you can take a look at that. If you have additional questions after reading the FAQ, again, please don't hesitate to reach out at nagbnominations at ed.gov. Most importantly, please submit your nominations uh, by the October 18th deadline. We do not offer extensions, so uh, we encourage you to, to make sure that uh, you get those in in a timely fashion. And we are really happy to, again, answer questions along the way. Um, we encourage you to nominate yourself or nominate someone you think would be a good fit. And we want to thank you all for participating today. We hope to see you on the board in 2020. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, staff, for putting it together. And Hatcher Group, we appreciate it.